So as we wait for a few things to get uh, set up visually, I'd like to say good afternoon. Thank you for joining us at the virtual All Candidates Forum organized and hosted by the South Surrey and White Rock Chamber of Commerce. My name is Ritu Khanna, Executive Director of the Chamber. I would like to start by acknowledging that we are hosting this forum uh, on the traditional and unceded territory of the Semiama First Nature First Nation. The Chamber is a not-for-profit organization serving the community since 1937. We advocate for small for we advocate for support and promote businesses and the community at large. Our services ramped up significantly since March of 2020 in response to the pandemic. We have organized and hosted over 100 virtual events, including community town halls, special topic webinars, business courses, the Business Excellence Awards, the Provincial All Candidates Forum, and we are one of the only business organizations in BC that offered a weekly networking virtual meeting to give local business people the opportunity to meet, collaborate, support one another, and also be featured. We have initiated a number of support local programs, including sell selling over $5,000 worth of gift cards that went directly back to local businesses. We have been sharing a stream of communications and updates through our e-newsletter and social media channels. If you own or work for a business in South Surrey and White Rock, I invite you to engage with the Chamber and join. Membership is an investment in your business as well as your local business community. We present today's All Candidates Forum for the Federal Riding of South Surrey and White Rock as another service to our community to engage in the democratic process and make an informed decision to vote. On the screen, you'll see the riding map. You go east to 196 Avenue, north to Highway 10 or 56 Avenue, west to the Bay and south to the US border. The candidates running in the riding are Carolyn Finley for the Conservative Party of Canada, Gordy Ho for the Liberal Party of Canada, Gary Jensen for the People's Party of Canada, and June Liu for the Democratic New Democratic Party of Canada. I would like to mention uh, that Carrie Lynn Finley will not be able to join us today. She sends her deep regrets. She did uh, have a fall uh, which required um, her to go to the hospital. She's doing okay, but she does need some extra time to recover. So um, she will not be part of this, uh, this forum today. On behalf of the chamber, I would like to thank each of the candidates for standing up to represent our community. We ask everyone who's watching and listening to do so with an open and respectful mind and heart now and throughout the election period, even if you disagree with some of the points shared. I'd like to thank our sponsors. As a not-for-profit organization, the Chamber could not do the important work that we do without the support of our sponsors and members. I will invite a representative to say a few words or show a video. First, uh, we have from the Fraser Valley Real Estate Board, Chris Savage, Chair, Government Relations Committee. Thank you, Chris. Oh, you're on mute. Get you off mute. Let's try to get you off mute there. Mm. Uh, yeah, I think you have to press a button. If you're being sent a request to unmute yourself. See if there's uh, something that's come up. There we go. Thank you. And well, on behalf of the Fraser Valley Real Estate Board and 4,000 members, I'd like to thank, uh, I'd like to thank the, the, the Chamber of Commerce, South Surrey, White Rock Chamber of Commerce for inviting us to be part of this today. Um, this has been over the last 18 months, probably the most challenging time we've ever seen in housing in, 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 in any near history. And uh, this has been recognized from all of the candidates. And we would like to take this opportunity to reach out to the federal candidates. And, and we're looking for help 
We're looking for help that with our local communities, our, 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 the province, we are looking for solutions to the housing affordability crisis. We think that this is, um, it's needed. We are looking forward to having a dialogue here today and uh, just can't wait, but thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you so much, Chris. Appreciate that. We have a short video uh, from our sponsor, the Chambers Plan. It's one of the best rated employee benefits plan exclusively offered by the Chamber Network, an important tool to take care of your employees and to attract and retain them as well. When you're responsible for every little detail, here's one thing that you don't have to worry about. Your Chambers Plan employee benefits. The rates stay manageable and predictable because more than 30,000 Canadian businesses are pooled in the plan. And you never have to compromise on benefits and extra features for you and your staff. Better benefits, stable rates, and a chance to relax, at least for an hour. This is what Canada's number one employee benefits plan looks like. Great, thank you. And I'd like to bring on Carlos Lopena, president of the White Rock BIA. Carlos? Thank you, Lutu. Uh, good afternoon, candidates and attendees. Uh, Carlos Lopena, I wish to thank the, uh, the sorry, White Rock Chamber for organizing this important event. Also, as chair of the White Rock Business Improvement Association and co-sponsor, welcome our members uh, all throughout White Rock. Um, thank you for uh, your questions as well uh, to the candidates, uh, a spokesperson uh, for the White Rock BIA. I'm uh, very appreciative about the high quality of candidates that uh, we have here. Unfortunately, we uh, do not have uh, Miss uh, Finley uh, because of the injury, too, too bad. Uh, but anyway, I'm uh, again, very appreciative about the high quality candidates, the dedication to our community and good luck to the election. Wonderful, thank you so much, appreciate that. And now uh, I'd like to introduce our moderator and get into the proceedings. Uh, we welcome Lance Peverly. He knows our community well. Uh, many of you will recognize him as he is born and raised in White Rock and served as the editor of the Peace Arch News for 12 years. He also was a moderator at our last federal all candidates forum, which was in person in 2019. Thank you for joining us and helping us out today, Lance. I'll pass it on to you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Rita. I appreciate the uh, opportunity. Uh, the last time we did this, I was sitting uh, in front of the audience and they saw the back of my head. So this will be slightly scarier for some of them, I'm sure. Uh, the structure of the meeting today is uh, each candidate will receive one minute for opening remarks. After each question, each candidate will receive, receive one minute to respond. At the 45 second mark, the candidate will be given a visual cue to wrap up. When you go over, your uh, it will be muted on you. So. The order of who responds first will rotate by last name, starting with the introductory statements. And after each question, after everyone has responded, candidates will be asked if they want to respond by another candidate's comments and be given 20 seconds. I'll be keeping a tally of that. We'll try to give everybody an opportunity just because of the length of the meeting. We may be cutting you off if you're, uh, if you're wanting to follow up with that extra 20 seconds every single time. At the very end, each candidate will be given one minute to make closing statements at the end of the forum. The questions that we're about to ask have been compiled by the chamber in advance, some submissions by members, sponsors, and the chamber network. And I believe we're gonna go into uh, opening remarks and uh, because candidate Finley is not here, I will read her uh, the biography that they've sent this time. Incumbent, incumbent South Surrey White Rock MP, Carrie Lynn Finley previously served as Minister of Revenue and as Associate Minister of National Defense. She grew up on Vancouver Island and graduated from UBC, after which she established a successful Vancouver law practice. Highly involved in her community, she has served as a BC India Business Network Advisory Board member and treasurer of BC and Alberta Guide Dogs. She lives in Panorama Ridge with her husband Brent, has four children and four grandchildren. Next, we will go to candidate Hope. I thank you very much, Lance, and I'd like to start by acknowledging that we live, work, and play on the traditional unceded territory of the Samyamu, Kwantlen, Kwantlen, and uh, Kwantlen, what's the other, Katsi, as well as the Coast Salish people. And uh, I'd also like to extend my uh, best wishes to Carrie Lynn Finley for the 
problem that she's had and hopefully she recovers quickly and gets back to being involved. I've uh, lived in this uh, community all of my life. My father was uh, the first physician in the area and has contributed over those years to the development of the hospital in this area. I have been very fortunate to have served this community as a member of the White Truck City Council, as a mayor, as a member of the Legislative Assembly for uh, 20 years with a number of different cabinet posts within that, and then for two years as a member of parliament. The, uh, I've also been, been blessed to have participating in a number of nonprofit societies. I currently sit on the Food Bank Species uh, Board, which coordinates 103 food banks around the province. I'm on the Indigenous Sports and Recreation Council, and I'm working at an institute at Simon Fraser, Simon Fraser University. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. We will go to candidate Jensen. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Gary Jensen. Um, I'm first and foremost a husband and father. I live over in Ocean Park and I love White Rock, South Surrey. Um, I decided to run because I wasn't happy with uh, the current state of affairs and uh, I felt like uh, my views weren't necessarily being shared by a lot of the other establishment parties. So I decided to put my uh, hat in the ring and uh, hopefully give uh, people who uh, see things the same way as me uh, a voice. And I really appreciate uh, you giving me an opportunity to uh, sit down with uh, some pillars of the community and talk about stuff. So thanks. Thank you very much. And we'll move on to candidate Lou. Hi everyone, my name is June. I am your NDP candidate here in South Surrey, White Rock. Um, like Gordy had mentioned earlier and like the uh, moderators had mentioned earlier, I like to acknowledge that we are on the land of the Samiamu, Keitsi, Coquitlam, Kwantlen, Kikate, and Tawasin First Nations. Um, and it's important that we remember this and we do our part to um, be a part of the reconciliation journey. Um, a little bit about myself. Um, I've been a community activist and philanthropist ever since I was a kid right here in Surrey. Um, I've been involved in the Samiamu Rotary and uh, hosting and organizing the SASE Award ever since 2013 when I won. Um, I'm also, I was also a youth representative on the Surrey Social Policy Advisory Committee um, and I was involved in implementing strategies surrounding newcomer settlement, housing and poverty reduction. Um, I also worked for the Local Immigration Partnership um, a few years back, uh, ensuring um, different uh, organizations and newcomers were having their voices heard by each other. Um, I have a BA uh, in political science from SFU and I've been involved in both partisan and nonpartisan political activities since starting school there. I want to thank everybody for being here today and thank you all for uh, holding the space for us to have a fun, um, friendly debate and, and chat and uh, learn more so we can make an informed decision on September 20th. Thank you. Thank you very much, all three of you. Uh, we're going to start the questions now and just uh, as we said before, we're going to be alternating. Uh, the first answer is going to come from candidate Jensen, then Lou, then Hope. Question is, this was provided from the BC Chamber BIA sponsor and the topic is economic recovery. If elected, what will be the economic priorities for your government to help small businesses recover from the impact of the pandemic and help them grow in the future, including your party's plans on extending or stopping government benefits for small businesses? Candidate Jensen. Well, first of all, the PPC, we're, we're all about reducing taxes and uh, I believe that we need to we need to go to the Bank of Canada and we got to stop the money printing. We've got to reduce inflation, like these ridiculous inflation targets of 2%. Those need to go down to zero. And in order to help people grow their businesses and uh, take care of like the logistics of running those businesses, we need to get rid of things like carbon tax. Uh, these ideological taxes, they just don't, they don't serve the small businesses. They hinder them. Uh, Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. I'm not sure if that's frozen for everybody. I think it is, yeah. You know what we'll do, uh, Candidate Jensen, we, we, uh, you got cut off partway through. I will come back to you if you're able to either reconnect or how we'll go. Let's move on to Candidate Lou. Hello. Uh, can, you, can you hear me? Yes. 
Okay. Uh, so yeah, pandemic recovery is definitely on the top of our list of things to do. We have a plan to make sure that those who have profited the most during the pandemic are the ones that are paying for the pandemic recovery. Um, and so that means that uh, what we want to do is make sure that small businesses have the support they need, they have the resources they need, and that this is coming from the government and this is coming from each other and from the community. We want to make sure that we go after uh, the, you know, the, the people who profited the most, big companies that have paid next to nothing in taxes, companies like Google, companies like Facebook, companies companies like uh, Netflix, uh, Amazon, um, they pay next to nothing and they profit off the back of Canadians. And we want to redirect um, that money back into our community. And we want to make sure that it is the mom and pop shops that in our community that we love and cherish and are a part of us um, that we are able to, to support. And we also want to make sure that workers uh, have a easy time getting back um, to work and that they are having a good time so that we can all uh, pro you know prosper together. Thank you. Thank you very much much uh, continue even though we got off a little bit there we're going to go to uh candidate hope first and then candidate jensen it looks to me like you froze at about the 40 second mark so we'll let you continue after candidate hope candidate hope in the u.s uh, am I off? thank you very much uh, and thank you for the the question clearly there are significant issues we're facing uh, covid has provided us with uh, one of the most uh, challenging times in terms of our economy since world war ii and we've uh, responded reasonably well to that. I think we're pretty proud of the actions we've taken. I think we're ranked at least seven, second in the G7 nations in terms of vaccinations and recovery through that. In terms of employment, uh, we've seen uh, we're back to about 92% of employment that uh, dropped during COVID. And uh, in compare, as a comparator, the United States, I think is roughly 75%. So we're doing much responding much more effectively in terms of getting back people back to work and in the positions that, that we want to have them in. We clearly have uh, many more challenges to face and uh, so this is not only a challenge but a, an opportunity and we're looking at a number of, of other strategies and people are looking at new ways of responding to the workforce that they're a part of and those challenges give us a great opportunity to respond to those needs. Thank you very much. Uh, now we're going to go back to candidate Jensen. We've used up about 40 seconds of your time. I don't know if you want to sum up or if you want to continue from where you left off, but uh, candidate Jensen. Yeah, I think the main thing is, is we just got to stop taxing our citizens into oblivion. If if you want them to, to be successful in investment in themselves and recover, you got to stop taking money from them. Uh, that's about all I have to say about it. Thank you very much. We will move on to question two and we'll go in the order of candidates Lou, Hogue, and then Jensen. This question was submitted by the Canadian Chamber and it's on the topic of economic recovery. If elected, where on your government's list of priorities you would you be lowering the national debt and what measures would you take to make this happen? We will start with candidate Lou. Thank you. Um, like we had said earlier, um, or like I had said earlier, um, it's, it's about going after the big guys um, and instead of going after, you know, us general folk. Um, and so we, uh, we believe that if we um, budget accordingly and we allocate funds where it needs to be spent instead of, you know, handing out these uh, big checks to big corporations um, with those subsidies going straight into the pockets of big investors, um, we can really redirect those funds and help support the people of Canada and while also uh, reducing our national debt. Um, you know, these things are not mutually exclusive. We can support people. We can build um, a better community for all of us um, in a sustainable and affordable way. We just have to make sure that we are uh, spending money where it needs to be spent and we are uh, taxing uh, those who really have been profiting off the off the backs of us um, instead of each other. Thank you very much. We will move on to candidate Hogue. Well, the actions taken by government to this point in time have been pretty positive in terms of our economy's performance. We're seeing a, a growth and we're seeing inflation working uh, in that fashion. In terms of paying off the debt, clearly uh, every dollar that we spend now will be, well, through inflation, will be a smaller dollar. 20 years from now, if you had, multiply two and a half percent, we're, we'll probably be paying off with 25% of those. And th that was the way that we recovered after World War II. That's the way we recovered when we had a downturn in the early 2000s. And certainly that is an economic model, which is supported by virtually all economists that spending at this time and looking at the, the growth rate and being able to pay back debts at a smaller rate. Those of us who purchased houses when the economy was, was 
not going very well, saw how much we had to pay for our mortgages, how much better they became as things proceeded. And, uh, and we earned more and inflation puts us in a better place to pay debt, both personally and as a country. Thank you very much. And we'll move on to candidate Jensen. Yeah, so I think that uh, we, we need to start turning our focus on where our money is going uh, federally. A lot of spending goes out to other countries and to programs outside of the country. I think if we cut spending on those and actually started investing in ourselves and put a real focus on paying off deficits, we could do that but we really have to start cutting and having a serious look at some of the programs we're, we're throwing money away on. And uh, yeah, and like I said before with uh, the Bank of Canada, I honestly don't think inflation is a good thing. Uh, right now, the government's in charge of, uh, they basically making it easy for people to buy houses when they can't really afford them. And taxpayers are on that look for, for a lot of that. Uh, a lot of that liability and a lot of that debt. And I think we need to uh, start having a serious look at where a lot of our money is going. Thank you very much. Uh, we will be moving on to the next question. I'm assuming any candidate that has any rebuttals for any of these will just alert me uh, visually as, uh, as we're going through them. Question number three was provided by the uh, chamber, BC chamber, on the topic of labor shortage. Labor shortages are a significant concern in our community. What is your party proposing to address this and what role do you think immigration should play? We'll start off with candidate Hogue. Oh, uh, we'll have to unmute uh, candidate Hogue. I'm not sure if, there we go. I'm sure I can't say it any better than I just did. Uh, <laughs> we, we, uh, I have met with a number of uh, small business owners in South Surrey and White Rock over the past uh, few months and looked at the challenges they have. And a number of them are saying that they're losing staff members, that they are in a, a big shortage in terms of being able to get people to, to work for them. And that's happening in long-term care facilities. It's happening in small businesses. The challenges uh, that face us are certainly the, the demand and a lot of people are readjusting based on what the, the COVID has provided. So we've seen a lot of uh, futurists and economists tell us that people are now readjusting and looking at different types of jobs and going back for more education with respect to those. In terms of, specifically in terms of immigration, yes, we, we need to have more immigrants. We know that we live in, a, in a, long, a large country and that our growth has been based largely on, on immigrants. And our, if we don't have immigration, we're not gonna be able to respond to the economic needs that we have, nor are we gonna be able to grow our economy in the ways that we want it to. Thank you very much. We'll be moving on to candidate Jensen. Oh, we need to unmute uh, candidate Jensen. Sorry about that. Yeah, I think we need to actually reduce immigration. Um, the, the large influx of immigration is a, it's not helping, helping the housing market and it's not necessarily helping with the employment. I think what we need to do is focus on uh, for getting people to a point where they can afford to live where they work. A lot of the, the demand for uh, a lot of these workers is they can't live near where the, good, the, the jobs are. So um, I think before we start looking at that, we need to address that. where are these people going to live and how are they going to be able to afford it? Um, uh, yeah, that's all I got to say about that. Thank you very much. And we'll move on to candidate Lou. Thank you. So um, in the pandemic, we saw that across Canada, about 100,000 women had left the workforce due to the pandemic. Um, and first and foremost, we would like to, um, you know, uh, implement a $10 a day childcare policy. That way it allows women who want to go back to work uh, the freedom to do so. Um, on top of that, we want to make sure that students are able to uh, attend post-secondary and afford to do so with uh, lower student loans. Um, and uh, back student loans in that way and lower student loan interest in that way, um, they can get the qualifications they need for the jobs that they want and get into the workforce um, when, whenever they, they are ready to do so. We would also like to protect uh, temporary foreign workers to ensure that they can stay here and uh, with their rights protected so they can continue to contribute to the Canadian economy. And of course, uh, we have a plan for foreign credential recognition. That way, uh, qualified workers, skilled workers can continue to work in Canada in the industries that they are uh, talented and qualified to do so in um, and 
And that is all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to see a rebuttal then it looks like. Oh, here we go. Uh, candidate Hope. Well, firstly, the $10 daycare plan has been uh, negotiated uh, with the Federal Liberal Party and certainly for British Columbia with the NDP and that uh, program is, is now ready to run. And that is certainly going to put more women into the workforce and it's gonna assist us with uh, the needs we have. Secondly, we've targeted specific incentives for low-income seniors and for working and supporting upscaling so that people will be able to move up into the workforce and certainly support new immigrants in that fashion as well. Thank you very much. We will move on to question number four now. And this one came from our sponsor, the Fraser Valley Real Estate Board on the subject of housing affordability. For many Canadians, homeowners, home ownership has become out of reach. Some argue housing affordability is a provincial and municipal issue that can only be solved with solutions at the local level. What is your party planning at a federal level to help Canadians finance their first home purchase? We're gonna start with Kennedy Hanson. Just want to make sure everyone heard the last part of that question, Lance. You um, no, I look at the last sentence. Then, what is your party planning at a federal level to help Canadians finance their first home purchase and realize the dreams of owning a home? So, I I believe. Uh, can Can you guys hear me? Okay, good. Yeah. Um, again, with uh, what I was saying before, with uh, the Bank of Canada and the inflation rates, we need to we need to knock those down to zero. And I also believe that uh, uh, yeah, we need <laughs> we need to get rid of the um, Canada needs to get out of the business of giving out mortgages and making it easier for people because it's not making that easier for them. It's helping them get into homes they can't afford. We need to uh, we need to privatize that industry and the liability should be on private industry for for those debts and I think um, I think we also need to curb our uh, our immigration because it's inflating our market arbitrarily 40 percent of all the immigrants that come in go to cities like Vancouver and Toronto and it heats up the the market kind of and twists the market in a way that regular Canadians can't can't even afford to buy anything for themselves. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, we'll move on to candidate Lou. Um, I like to just say that immigrants are also uh, regular Canadians. Um, that is something that I am experiencing right now. I'm a regular Canadian, I'm an immigrant, I'm right here. Um, and I'm just like, I'm also struggling to buy a home. I'm 26 years old and uh, it took me it was a huge pain in the butt to save up to be able to put a down payment on on even a small condo. And so I feel I feel you. I feel these struggles. Um, and the NDP has a plan. We have a plan to uh, bring back CMHC backed uh, loans and uh, mortgages. That way, um, you know, whatever interest we make goes back into the system. And we also are able to um, provide uh, options for lower down payments so younger young people like myself can afford to get into homes and we also want to make sure that you know there's a uh, controlled rent um, so that seniors don't get priced out of their own homes and in their own communities we want to also provide a speculation tax to prevent house flipping um, and we also want to uh, either uh, limit or um, reduce uh, the number of foreign investors so that uh, housing market is not being used as a game because they are homes for people to live in and that's how it should be. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll move on to candidate Hope. Uh, certainly, this is a, a really important issue, and uh, I have a son who is experiencing that now and can't afford uh, to find housing or to afford uh, to build anything himself. So, we're helping we're, the Liberal Party is planning to help first time home buyers by doubling the first time home buyers' tax credit from $5,000 to $10,000 and first time savings, home savings account to allow Canadians up to age 40 to save up to $40,000 for their first home and withdraw that tax-free when it's time to buy. Secondly, we've got a $1 billion in funding for rent to own programs. We've got building 1.4 million new homes over the next four years. And we're taking action against speculators with a 1% tax on vacant non-resident, non-Canadian owned homes and banning foreign ownership for two years. These are significant uh, strategies which will hopefully make uh, housing more affordable in, in the big challenging times we have, particularly in the lower mainland of British Columbia. 
Thank you very much. If there are no rebuttals for that topic, we'll move on to the next one, which was submitted by Chief Harley Chapel of the uh, Samamu First Nation. The subject says Indigenous. How do you and your party plan to reconcile relations with Indigenous groups across the country and more specifically with the local Samamu First Nation? What is your party's plan and roadmap to the calls to action in UNDRIPs? That's the United Nations Declarations of the Rights of the Indigenous, Indigenous People. We'll start with candidate Lou for this one. Thank you. Um, reconciliation is a really big part of what we do. Uh, we are the part that has run the most uh, the Indigenous candidates this time around, as far as I've seen so far. Um, we have a we have a uh, promise to bring uh, clean drinking water immediately. No more delays. No more you know waiting until 2016. Um, under our plan, we also have um, a true nation to or want to build a true nation to nation relationship, um, so that nations can speak on behalf of themselves for what they need and what they want and um, self determine. Uh, you know, how to rule themselves. Um, under our plan, we also want to have a, a healthy partnership where we can help provide uh, safe housing, um, clean drinking water, respectful and safe access to healthcare and justice, um, a, a justice system that works with them and for them, as opposed to um, their overrepresentation in um, uh, incarceration. Um, and we also want to ensure that they have the children's services they need um, to build up their culture as they have been lost. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll move on to candidate Hogue. Certainly the United Nations uh, or the UNRIP report is an important one, which uh, I have supported personally and our party has supported as well. I was uh, disappointed to see that the conservatives voted against it. And I think that uh, I hope that those values that are reflected in UNRIP are certainly part of what I think are, are Canadian values. I've worked with the Samuel First Nation to ensure that they do get off the boil water alert, which they were on for some 17 years, and they are now off that. They are now in a position of being able to do development of housing and moving forward. They are in a very progressive position, and we have been supporting them in order to achieve the goals that they have. They have uh, contributed greatly to this community, and uh, they are an integral and important part of this community, and I think that is well reflected in the works that they, they have done with the city and with the province and now more having their voice heard more effectively nationally. Thank you very much. We'll move on to candidate Jensen. So uh, the PPC, they'll want to, we want to replace uh, the, the Indian Act. Uh, we want to look at like, we want to look at getting, getting a lot of these indigenous communities uh, on equal footing with uh, the rest of Canada. Uh, it's not fair that a lot of their communities don't have clean drinking water um, and a lot of their living situations, they're almost third world. And uh, we need to start looking at the $21 billion that gets poured into their communities. We need to start looking at where that's going and actually getting it to those communities. And we got to stop shooting down infrastructure projects like the pipelines and stuff that would have helped those communities grow and uh and help them you know enter the middle class essentially um yeah that's all i gotta say about that thank you very much uh with a rebuttal from uh, candidate hope well not a rebuttal but to supporting some of the values that were reflected there the liberal party has committed 18 billion dollars for a program for indigenous peoples in terms of looking at their needs and ensuring that uh, it's addressing the issues put forward and under it. And I, that's a, a historic contribution to looking at that and also advancing the call for justice for the National Inquiry of Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls, which I, I think are important about Canadian values that should be more honored and respected. Thank you very much. We will move on to question number six. And this one was a, a joint question from the Chamber and the BIA, our sponsors on the topic of, uh, topic of vaccine passports. How will your party support provinces with the vaccine passport programs, as well as small businesses in the restaurant and fitness sectors who are being asked to be the gatekeepers of the program? We'll start with candidate Hold. Well, our party has been very clear with where we are with respect to vaccine passports. We uh, believe that and every candidate had to be double vaxxed we are expecting and working with each province and uh, looks as though we're, we're very close to an agreement with British Columbia. 
in terms of vaccine passports and ensuring that uh, we're following the best practices, medical practices. I was uh, somewhat surprised to see that uh, some parties are not supporting that. Some parties are saying that uh, it's that's not that important. And I think it truly is significant and important. This is the, the biggest uh, medical challenge we've had through COVID for, for probably since smallpox it's come along this way. And it, without double vaccination, we are seeing what's happened to Alberta. They, they said that things were over and they backed off and all of a sudden they're exploding again. Unless we take positive action in terms of vaccines and passports, we're not gonna be able to protect the people uh, in, our, in our communities and across our country. And that's an integral part of the role and responsibility of governments. Thank you very much. We'll move on to candidate Jensen. Um, well, I will say this about vaccine passports. They're tyrannical. I think they, you should have, this should be a free choice issue where people choose what they put in their bodies. The, the science behind COVID has been all over the place and it hasn't, like this whole pandemic has been like horribly handled by the liberal government. Uh, vaccine passports, in my opinion, and in the PPC's opinion, uh, there's no place for them. They're, they're tyrannical. It's uh, government overreach at, at its peak, almost its peak. And uh, it shouldn't be happening. People and businesses should be allowed to choose what they do and who they uh, do business with and who they interact with. Obviously, with COVID, we need to protect the, you know, everybody who's immunosuppressed, the elderly. We need to protect those people. But the numbers just don't don't show don't pan out here for making everybody from like as young as 12 or even younger wear masks and and have these silly passports thank you very very much sorry we've had to cut you off there uh, candidate jensen we're going to move on to candidate lou thank you so a uh, vaccine passport is is a really fun word I, I don't know why we've chosen that term but essentially it's an immunization record just like the immunization record you would need um, to to go to attend school to attend kindergarten to attend daycare um, that's been something that has always existed and it because as, as new um, diseases arise, there's no reason we don't continue to do those programs and expand to keep up with the times. Um, the science is very clear, um, and I do think that this should be a nonpartisan issue. As Canadians, it's our duty to protect each other um, and to care for each other, that we're part of a society, we're part of a community, and it's our uh, responsibility to do our part to make sure that we are safe and that our neighbours are also safe. Um, with regards to the vaccine passport, we are committed to working with all the provinces to ensure that everybody who can be vaccinated has access and is able to prove it. And we want to uh, support uh, workers um, with their struggles with uh, enforcing these things um, and making sure that they have all the uh, workers' rights um, in place and protections in place so that they can go on and do their jobs efficiently and effectively. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we've got time for rebuttals. If anybody else would like to do one, I see candidate Hogue has his hand up. Uh, sorry, sorry to keep coming here, but I just wanted to respond to, to Gary's comments because certainly I believe that people have the right and freedom and I have the right and all of us have the right to go into our house and drink all we want to drink of alcohol, but we can't go out and drive because that presents a risk to other people. I think the same thing, the same analogy and metaphor applies to, to COVID and to a vaccine. You can stay in your house and not be vaccinated, but if you're going to go out and harm or potentially harm other people, then you shouldn't have the right to do that. We are going to have uh, two more um, rebuttals to this. Let's start with uh, candidate uh, Lou. Uh, I actually want to add to Gordy's uh, point. I agree. Um, I think it's really important that we protect each other. And much like the way we do with many other things, um, we do need to show a record of doing something when we want to engage in a privilege. So for example, we have driver's licenses to make sure that we know how to drive when we're not uh, harming others. We have a passport to show uh, where we're going when we travel across uh, state borders and, and countries' borders. And these are things that we've always had and we've always uh, continued to uh, enforce. And so there's no reason that this should be any different. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now we've got a rebuttal from candidate Jensen. The government should not be allowed to exercise this kind of authority on people. Honestly, the, the vaccine doesn't do anything. You're going to need booster after booster after this. It doesn't, you can still transmit the disease. You can still catch the disease, even after you've been double vaxxed. The, the passport is just a lip service or something. I don't know what it is, but this, it's ridiculous. 
And I'm going to stand by that. Thank you very much. We'll move on to the next question. This one is uh, submitted by Sandra Christian from Creative Kids and Heidi Briggs from Evergreen Childcare. And it's on the topic of childcare. It's a longer question. I'll read it out to you now. Childcare services is an important essential service to keep women in the workforce. It's a sector that needs more support, but the proposed $10 a day childcare by different parties has raised significant concerns for many private childcare providers in our community. They feel it is an inaccurate description of what it costs to care for a child. Quality childcare cannot be provided for the same cost of two coffees a day. By eliminating profits, leaves little, uh, by eliminating profits leaves little funds to raise the livable wages of staff and reinvest in the businesses that have historically been built and run by women entrepreneurs. It will also be a burden on taxpayers to pay for such a program if offered to all families, regardless of income. How does your party respond to these concerns? We're gonna start with candidate Jensen. Um, I'm all about privatization. I don't think the government should be doing these little handouts for for childcare. I mean, I understand like with, with my wife, we made the decision that she would work from home and it's been very difficult, but she decided to do that because she wanted to have more hands-on approach. And that's what a lot of people wish they could do. But I understand that most people are in a financial situation where both parents have to work and childcare is very expensive. But I don't believe that this $10 a day thing is, is fair to the childcare workers and their businesses. It's, it's, you're basically undercutting their businesses. And I, I don't think that's necessarily a good thing and the government shouldn't be doing it. Thank you very much. We'll move on to candidate Lou. Thank you. So much like healthcare, um, we see that childcare is something that is an essential service to our society for um, just to make things work. Um, you know, we pay, we as tax taxpayers pay money into our healthcare system to ensure that we can support each other and get the help that we need when we need it. So there's no reason that childcare should be any different. We're investing in our future. We're investing in our next generation and ensuring that uh, affordable childcare spaces exist is super important to uh, making sure that our next generation has the best head start that they can have. Um, when it comes to profits and affordability, uh, there's no reason why there should be profit in terms of um, in terms of in terms of social services. However, this, is, this does not mean that workers do not get fairly compensated. We want to make sure that the government is doing our part to uh, make it accessible and affordable, um, and supporting these institutions and these um, childcare spaces so that you know workers can be fairly compensated um, and that children are also uh, able to access these services when they need it. Thank, Thank you. you very much, and we'll move on to candidate Hope. Uh, we need to unmute the candidate Hope. Certainly in South Surrey White Rock, the median fee for an infant in, in daycare is about 1,050 a month and 917 for a toddler. So that's an awful lot about, it's over $23,000 a year. And a lot of people can't afford that. But by having the $10 a daycare plan, which is working in Quebec, which is working in Australia and is managed in a positive way and freeing up more women to get into the workforce, that has actually grown the economy. And uh, so many of the women were forced out of it. In most cases, women when COVID came along and forced the workforce to be re re reduced in record numbers. We're now seeing it grow. And if we can introduce this uh, agreement, which we already have with British Columbia, if this could be introduced with $10 a day daycare, it's going to improve our economy as well. And we're going to see that type of growth and it's going to support families who otherwise wouldn't be able to have daycare and might be stuck at home. Thank you very much. If there are no rebuttals, I'll move on to the next question from the Fraser Valley Real Estate Board on the subject of housing affordability. How will you work towards implementing recommendations from the Canada BC Expert Panel on the future of housing supply and affordability released in June, 2021, such as making new infrastructure investments conditional on official community plans, zoning bylaws, and other local policies to allow for increased density and a mix of housing types. We will start this one with candidate Lou. Thank you. So uh, yeah, those are definitely some great recommendations. I, I can't say that we have anything that would go directly against it. Um, we are definitely supportive of having uh, more government built infrastructure and having more support in that se sector um, to ensure that we have mixed uh, density and affordable uh, res residential um, 
you know, buildings go up um, and developments. Um, a, a really important point um, is that we want to make sure that there's both a supply and affordable housing that uh, people can buy if they choose to be homeowners, but we also want to secure um, a decent chunk of uh, housing for uh, rental exclusive, uh, exclusive rentals, uh, because, you know, that's not, that's a choice that people want to be able to make. And we want to make sure that uh, things are accessible and available, um, regardless of what your choices are, what it, regardless of what your finances are. Housing is a human right in our, um, as, as we believe. And so we want to make sure that everybody can access the housing that they need and they want and suits their needs best. And it's the government's job to make sure that um, these are options available to them. Thank, Thank you. you very much. We'll move on to candidate Hogue. Well, certainly the, this is a significant challenge, which we've already discussed somewhat in the, in the previous questions, but certainly creating the child care benefit has really helped giving uh, opportunity in terms of the issues of affordability. Uh, tax cuts to small businesses have helped that, but a big job challenge is the 38% increase that we've seen and being able to develop more and more housing. And that, that's certainly the biggest challenge that Yeah, I know. Are you, is anybody here? He's, he froze, yeah. Okay, that's okay. What we'll do is we'll move on to candidate Jensen and then come back to uh, candidate Hope to finish up. Candidate Jensen. Yeah, so for, for housing, I don't think the government should be in the business of being a landlord. I think it distorts the, the market, the rental market especially. And... Uh, if you want to be able to invest, get move, move people, invest in building and 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 uh, like increasing the supply of housing, I think what we need to do is, as a federal government, we need to deter um, provincial and municipal governments from from these bureaucratic uh, rezoning these zoning issues that they have like, like the bureaucracy has gotten so big you can't build anything anymore it takes years for approvals and um i think the federal government should stop supporting that and and hopefully uh yeah encourage encourage a lot of these municipalities to start opening up and allowing people to build because there's a there's a need for housing and people need want to build. So we got we to gotta unleash that and allow them to do that. Thank you very much. Uh, we've lost one of our candidates here and I'm sure behind the scenes, we're gonna try to uh, get them back on as quickly as possible. If there are no rebuttals right now, we'll move on to the next question and we'll keep tabs on where we are if uh, candidate Hope is able to rejoin us. Next question comes from the Canadian Chamber, topic of, border, of the border and COVID-19. As a border community, Canada-U.S. relations is even more important. The COVID-19 pandemic has made those relations more complex. If elected, what actions will you and your party take, if any, to work towards open, more cross-border travel, business, and trade? Uh, let's see, we will um, we'll start with candidate Jensen, just to keep it in the same format. Um, I feel like we need to we need to open up more. Um, I think I think more business is good. I think the last six years, the the Liberal government has worked really hard at, I guess, suppressing any investment in in Canada, and it's actually been hurting trade. And now, to be fair, COVID kind of put a huge dent in everything, but I think we're kind of coming out of it right now. And I think we need to open our borders back up and allow Canadians to do business with our neighbors. Um, and I. I, yeah, that's all I got to say about that. Thank you very much. And we'll move on to candidate Lou. The U.S. has always been one of our uh, biggest trade partners, and we have always had a really historically great relationship with them. And it's really important that they we have um, these trade relations with them. However, uh, we have to do so in a way that keeps us safe, um, and it keeps both Canadians and Americans safe. And we don't we need to make sure that when uh, border when we open up borders, we're doing it in a way that is responsible to everybody and that uh, we're not risking the safety, the lives um, of, of each other, of our community. So uh, when it comes to trade, COVID-19 did put on some challenges. However, um, things and essential services and essential uh, products and items are still getting through the border. And so uh, while as much as we like to think that um, it has made a huge, huge dent, it has made a smaller than what we thought dent. Um, but in terms of uh, moving forward and our next steps, it is important that we are um, 
you know, opening up the border when it's appropriate and uh, at the appropriate time so that we can continue to build on our historically wonderful relationship and uh, keep fostering those uh, good business practices and trades uh, across the border. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, uh, it looks to me like we'll push on a little bit and we'll, uh, we'll start the next one uh, with candidate Lou. So you alternate while we've got two candidates. This one comes from the chamber and it's on systemic racism and discrimination. There are increased calls for racial justice and reconciliation due to the discovery of unmarked graves of indigenous children at former residential schools and the alarming violence against visible minorities across the country. What are your party's specific commitments to address these issues? Candidate Liu. So uh, as a person of color myself and as a, as a target of um, a lot of anti-Asian racism that has been especially highlighted um, during the pandemic, it's, you know, it really hits close to home when we talk about issues like this. Um, I, you know, it, it, it hurts. Um, things like that hurts. You know, my, my uh, one of my best friends, her grandmother was attacked unprovoked in Chinatown um, when she was just out to get groceries. And that's not OK. And that and we have to do something then uh, more than just pay lip service. Um, the NDP has a plan to uh, make sure that we are taking uh, a national effort to confront online hate and white supremacy. There are about 200 uh, white supremacists that are known in Canada. And we want to make sure that we are uh, doing what we can to, um, you know, just address them and tackle them and do our best um, to make sure that they are not allowed to, you know, spew their hate and uh, harm others. Um, and we want to put an end to systemic racism in the RCMP and the healthcare system and gather, we want to gather race-based data to track the problem. Um, and we want to make sure that moving forward that, um, you know, it's not just speeches and we have concrete action. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we'll move on to candidate Jensen. So in this idea of systemic racism, Racism exists and it will probably exist for, for all time. Honestly though, I think we gotta start looking at each other like Canadians and we gotta stop playing these little, we gotta stop playing politics with our culture, cultures and, and, and pitting each other against each other. The, the liberal government has done a really good job this last six years kind of tribalizing everybody and, and putting labels on everyone. Now, what happened to your grandmother, uh, June, is totally unacceptable and un-Canadian. And I think any rational Canadian would understand that. And usually when those kinds of things pop up, people rise up and, and they do something about it. But I don't think censoring the internet and and putting draconian measures in place to suppress uh, hate is a good idea. I, I think it sets a bad precedent for free speech in our country. And I think we need to be careful. Oh, sorry, were you giving me? Uh, yeah, it was up there, but thank you very much, uh, both candidates. Is there any rebuttal uh, on this? If you want to continue uh, talking, candidate Jensen, uh, I'm sure you can continue to rebut, but uh, why don't we move on to the next question? Uh, the next one- My apologies to candidate Jensen for not giving you that time warning. Uh, we're just trying to get uh, Kenneth Ho back in. I, I apologize. I thought I saw the time warning. My, my mistake then. Um, let's move on to the other question. This one's provided by the Chamber and it's on the topic of climate change. How does your party rate the importance of addressing climate change against the country's economic priorities and what specific commitments do you have to address issues like BC's wildfires in the future? And we'll start this one with candidate Jensen. We will un unmute uh, candidate Jensen, we don't hear you. Thank you. Cool. Uh, I think with climate change, I think that the science is kind of all over the place on climate change. And I feel like the government's answer to climate change and global warming is this alarmism that gives somehow justifies weird taxes and like the carbon tax. I honestly believe climate change is happening, but how much of that is man-made? How much of that is just nature? I don't know. And I don't think the scientists really know because their models are all over the place. But I do believe that with, in the case of the wildfires, more could have been done in investing in the infrastructure to fight those fires. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of money is being taken out of um, a lot of those fire departments. And I think we need to maybe put, put more money into that, but 
to to when it comes to the the global warming and the and all of this i don't know i i, I think we need to do more research um, I think uh, I don't. I don't think the answer is taxing people. Thank you very much, and we'll move on to candidate Lou. So the research and the science is very clear um, that you know humans are accelerating climate change and um, global warming. And so Canada is the only G7 country whose emissions have gone up since the Paris Agreement. And Canada has never met a single emission reduction goal. And that's not OK. So under the NDP, we have a plan to um, address this head on. Uh, we, will want, we are going to cut com uh, emissions by more than half and meet the 1.5 degree target that scientists say is necessary to prevent catastrophe. Um, and we want to make sure that the economy doesn't suffer in this situation. We want to create hundreds and thousands of good paying jobs, investing in clean energy, energy of, uh, efficient, affordable homes, electric transit, zero emission vehicles, and retrofit buildings across the country. We also want to um, open up education so that those who are working in the oil and gas industry have the opportunity to go back to school um, and update their skills so that they can transition to clean energy industries and also take uh, their expertise that they have learned from the oil and gas industry into creating uh, green new energy um, and those industries. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll have a rebuttal from candidate Jensen. I, I also just want to mention that Canada has one of the cleanest, most efficient and he most heavily regulated energy sectors in the world. And uh, honestly, our dent in the CO2 emissions is probably nothing compared to countries like India and China and a lot of these other countries. And uh, to be honest, like taxing your citizens for something you see happening all over the world is not the answer. That's just my main point. And uh, as for green energy... energy Thank effect, you very much, Candidate Judson. This is a, it's a shorter rebuttal, unfortunately. We'll move on to a rebuttal from Candidate Liu. Our plan is never to tax, um, you know, put, put the onus of the tax on the citizens. Our uh, goal is to go after the big polluters, so the companies that have been polluting our, um, our environment and making sure that they are paying the carbon tax and uh, we're making sure that they are being responsible and held accountable for their actions that have destroyed our environment as a collective. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we've already had uh, a rebuttal each. Uh, we do have a little bit of extra time just without our additional candidates. So I'm gonna give you both 15 seconds to sum up if you'd like to add anything else. Candidate Jensen. Yeah, uh, June says that you wanna tax these big corporations, but all of these companies, it's not just big corporations, it's small businesses too. And those taxes, those taxes go on to us, we pay for it. And it's just not, it's not right. And I, I agree that there's some regulation that needs to be there, but- Thank you, you very can't much. Tax okay. We'll have to move on with that. Candidate Lou, did you have anything to add? We're gonna move on to the uh, next question provided by the chamber. And this one's on the topic of transportation funding. What commitment will your party be able to provide to the communities like South Surrey and White Rock that are desperate for better and more investment in infrastructure and public transportation to provide affordable options to travel, not just to other jurisdic jurisdictions, but with our own two cities? We'll start with candidate Lou for this one. Yeah, so uh, I actually had a really fun conversation with the mayor of White Rock uh, the other day, and he was saying that, you know, it really is something that uh, we don't think about. It's not very much on the on the surface that um, infrastructure is a really huge part and infrastructure investment is a really huge part of uh, White Rock. And so White Rock has historically been, you know, it's a small city um, there. And so uh, what the resources they have are, are a little bit more limited. And so it's really important that we um, as, you know, at the federal level inject um, funds back into White Rock and make sure that they are able to, to hold up um, um, you know, and, and have their uh, residents get around to places. Um, we are committed to working with provincial governments to ensure that TransLink has increased bus services um, to the to, uh, more rural neighborhoods and uh, neighborhoods that have historically been underserved. And we're committed to um, making sure that uh, the infrastructure is there so that when we have increased service that they are not, um, you know, they're not uh, affecting other uh, modes of transportation. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we'll move on to candidate Jensen. Yeah, it's, um, I, I living in White Rock and I'm working in Vancouver. Um, sometimes my commute is like two and a half hours each way, and it is it's mind numbing. And even when you're sitting in traffic, going through the tunnel and stuff, it whew, it sucks sometimes. But I I believe that the the federal government should work with the provinces and and um, help the provinces fund projects like this so that, uh, well, I mean, it'll help the economy. And I think that uh, people need to get to where they 
they got to go get to work. And uh, the more time you can give them with their families and stuff, I think that's personally, I think that's a huge, a huge plus. And uh, yeah, I think I'd be all for supporting provincial governments and in funding those kinds of projects. Thank you very much. We'll move forward to the next question, which was also provided by the chamber. And this is on the subject of the pandemic. Although we are still in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic, it will likely not be the last pandemic the country will have to deal with. What lessons have you and your party learned to better respond in the future? How would your party handle things differently to prepare people, businesses, and the economy? We'll start with candidate Jensen. So with the, with the COVID response in this last year and a half, it kind of caught the whole world by surprise. And I mean, that's understandable, but we, We've had 18 months to kind of, you know, reconfigure and, and move things around here. And uh, honestly, if, if some like we should have a plan in place beforehand. And I don't think there was enough funding or, uh, yeah, I don't think there was enough funding in, in our emergency plan because we kind of got complacent. Um, I, think that, I think that would be a good idea to start funding emergency plans and having uh, having researchers ready to develop vaccines uh, that actually work. And uh, yeah, I think that's what I'll say. Thank you much. We'll move on to candidate Lou. Thank you. So uh, pandemic recovery and kind of addressing the pandemic is kind of a threefold issue. So first and foremost, we want to take a look at the countries that have done well across the world. And those are the countries that have listened to the experts right from the get go um, and have allowed experts in, in the, in the uh, on the topic to make those decisions and uh, uh, kind of lead those um, decisions. And so that is something that we should be doing. Um, I definitely think that we should be investing um, money into national pharmaceuticals so that when we have a vaccine, we are able to develop a vaccine uh, efficiently and the vaccine is affordable and accessible to all Canadians as soon as possible. We also wanna make sure that workers are supported during a pandemic if it ever happens again. And so that means we have um, paid uh, health, or sorry, paid sick leave um, for all workers. And we wanna make sure that if something does happen, if they are unable to work, that uh, unemployed workers can receive um, a livable uh, uh, subsidy or grant um, so that they can continue to provide for their families and they can continue to live dignified lives. Um, and you know what? That is time. I will, I'll, I'll end it there. Thank you. Thank you very much. What I'm going to do is I'm going to read out the question again uh, so that candidate Hogue can hear this one, and then we'll go for rebuttals. Uh, this one was from the chamber on the topic of the pandemic. Although we are still in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic, it will likely not be the last pandemic the country will have to deal with. What lessons have you and your party learned to better respond in the future? How would your party handle things differently to prepare people, businesses, and the economy? Candidate Hogan. Well, firstly, uh, I think that the strategies one takes in developing and planning for the future are based on uh, values and some of the uh, values that have been reflected in the actions which have stated by some of the other candidates. And I think that planning for uh, the future, we're looking at global warming and the challenges of that. So we have put a lot of money into looking at how do we better prepare for global warming. For instance, Crescent Beach areas, they, they're now changing the way they have to develop and we're putting more funding into that. The waterfront of White Rock, was significantly damaged and it was attributable to a storm and to raising uh, ocean levels and that damaged the pier. So it's putting a lot of money into those type of initiatives now so that with global warming happening, that will be a response to it. With COVID, it is the same initiatives that we have to take to respond to the, the direction that is being provided by, by COVID. Increased funding for research, increase, increase funding for vaccines, we were, we were used to produce vaccines in Canada. They disappeared under a, a number of years ago and we're, we're rebuilding that now. So those are two important initiatives we have to take in terms of research and vaccine for ensuring that we don't get another COVID. Challenge. Thank you very much, uh, candidate Hogue. Was there any rebuttal on uh, this topic? All right, all right. Uh, now that um, uh, candidate Hogue has joined us again, what I think we should do is just push on with the questions we've got. And if we've got time at the end, I'll, I'll go backwards a little bit. I would certainly encourage uh, all candidates, some of these questions are very, very striking to me. And, and just watching the video and candidate uh, Finley to the other candidate who was not able to make it today. Uh, if they're able to address some of these in their, in their social media and ads, that would be 
wonderful for our readers, I think. Next question is uh, a public question on the topic of the economy. To date, parties running in the current election have made many, many spending commitments. With regards to your own party's spending commitments, how does your party plan to pay for them? And how do you plan to secure funding for any commitments made specific to our riding? We'll start with candidate Hogue on that one. Well, I think that we partially answered that question previously that uh, came forward in terms of the actions that, that we're taking and certainly the uh, funding that has been put into the, the COVID response has looked at how we look at and manage uh, the future and uh, there are a number of initiatives that have gone forward and have been looked at in terms of increasing uh, education and, and preparation for job expansion and certainly the child care has been a part of that. So it, it is uh, an integral part of so many of the initiatives that are taking place that we've already responded to. So I, I think that uh, the COVID response, uh, again, has been very, very positive. We are ranked second of the G7 in terms of responses that we've had to that. We've got more employment going back into it than we've had before than any other country. So we're, we're looking very good in terms of that response and in preparing for the future is continuing to look and build and learn from the lessons that this COVID has provided to us. And I believe that we're doing that and doing it in a very effective way. Thank you very much. We'll go to candidate Jensen. Hopefully you can still hear me. It kind of went choppy there. Okay, yeah, yeah so. Yeah, you're fine. Okay, perfect. So um, the PPC, we wanna phase out all COVID spending. We wanna, we wanna get rid of some of these silly uh, deficits then we want to get rid of the deficit. So we got to start, we got to start by looking at things that we can start uh, axing here. I mean, the federal government spent a billion dollars for the CBC um, for an aid development. There was $5 billion there in uh, corporate we welfare, like handouts to these big corporations that needs to stop, especially with, uh, with companies that, that are frequently asking for, for handouts. We've, we've got to crack down on that stuff. And a lot of that money could be used to paying off the deficit and, and, and relieving some of the pressure that we're feeling as a country, especially after this COVID thing. Um, we need to simplify our tax system because, I mean, it's so complicated and convoluted. Uh, we've got to, um, and we've also got to cut personal income tax and corporate taxes and, uh, and eventually get rid of the capital gains tax. Thank you very much. And we'll move on to candidate Lou. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. So, um, you know, with, with regards to things like taxation, um, I have already addressed it earlier as well. Um, you know, we're, we're going after the big corporations. We're not going after, you know, your average people. So uh, our kind of, our plans here are ensuring that the ultra rich and the corporations pay their fair share. I agree with Gary that we should not be giving handouts to these big companies who have been, already made record profits during the pandemic um, and they should be paying, paying their fair share. Um, and it shouldn't, the, the burden of pandemic recovery and the, pan, and the burden of the national debt should not be on um, the backs of and the shoulders of working class Canadians um, and, and for the general public, it should be, it really should be on those who have made the most money off of us. Um, so we also want to be getting rid of tax loopholes and uh, making sure that the richest and the big corporations are paying their fair share um, and they're not able to, you know, squirrel money away through these, uh, these loopholes. And we want to make sure that we are uh, tough on tax evasion and tax avoidance. We want to really hone in and uh, inject some money into the um, the Canadian Revenue Agency to make sure that there nothing is uh, falling through the cracks and we are getting what we uh, as Canadians are entitled to. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll move on to the next question. This was submitted by a member of the public and it's on uh, the topic of discrimination and the LGBTQ plus community. What is your party's position on Bill C6, which calls for the ban on conversion therapy? And uh, we'll start with candidate Jensen with this one. So I, I I believe in four things, individual freedom, personal responsibility, respect and fairness. I don't care what your sexual orientation is, what your religious orient, where you're, where you are religiously. I don't care about your cultural background or anything like that. Those are all important things that make you an individual. But I don't believe that uh, the government should play favorites and pit pit each, everybody against each other. Um, I think that, uh, oh, back to the question. 
I, I think we got to stop paying identity politics and realize that we're all Canadians and we need to treat each other with respect and fairness. I, it's really that simple. Um, I, I think that there are people that do discriminate and don't understand, but I mean, we're gonna weed those people out through our social interactions and stuff. And I feel like, I feel like if everybody took a stance of respect and fairness, a, a lot of the- That's uh, We're gonna move on to candidate Lou. As a member of the LGBTQ community, I think the, this really rings true and uh, hits at home for me as well. I think, and uh, as a party, we've always uh, supported uh, outlawing criminalization of conversion therapy. Um, if you actually read about what goes on during conversion therapy, it's really messed up. Um, it's not an okay thing to, to happen, regardless of how you feel about the LGBTQ community. It, we as Canadians should not be setting up a system where it is okay to harm or abuse people. Um, and that's what a lot of these uh, therapies have, have shown to do and they've caused uh, lasting damage and trauma, and so um, I think, and so I think we're really, really proud to say that we are against conversion therapy, and uh, we have always voted in favor of it. So that's what I have to say. Thank you very much, candidate Hope. Well, certainly, I conversion therapy is uh, doesn't fit the, in my opinion, the values of Canada and what we represent and what we stand for. And I was very disappointed to see that. Uh, the Conservatives, when the, the ban came forward, that there was half of the Conservative MPs voted against the ban. And I, I think that's a bad reflection on, on what it is to be Canadian. Also, the Canada's first ever LGBTQ2 action plan and legislation with respect to those was, was put in place and is being dealt with by, by the Liberal Party of Canada. So there, the, the whole actions around this and the whole support that we've had for it has been very inclusive, very engaging, and very representative of people being able to make those kind of decisions in support of the choices that people can make with respect to who they are. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll move on to an, another question. Uh, this one was submitted by the Chamber. What would your party's strategy be to conduct diplomatic and trade relations with nations contravening human rights conventions like China and Afghanistan? And we'll start with candidate Liu. Yeah, so uh, we have, you know, we, we've always had a stance that we will stand by um, our own and we will stand by Canadian values. And so things like that, it is important that we have, you know, trade, we have, um, you know, our economy is well supported, but it's also important that we we understand that um, we, you can't violate the, the rule of international law and you, you have to, you know, stand true to uh, where, what, what your agreements were. And so um, it's, it's important that we impose um, specific sanctions to those who have been proven to violate human rights. It's important that we get our Michaels home and it's important that we we continue to stand by our Canadian values of um, human rights for all um, and yeah I think that's that's kind of our our stance on that um, we have uh, imposed you know uh, there have been sanctions imposed against our very own Heather McPherson we will always stand in solidarity with her um, and uh, Jenny Kwan and others who have spoken up against um, these human rights violations. Thank you very much. Uh, candidate Hogue. Certainly uh, opposed to the or we are opposed to the human rights violations that we're seeing and we're hearing. But we also believe that we need to have greater coordination with the G7 countries. We need to have the quantum necessary to put and be able to make sanctions, be able to take actions against those countries which are taking those uh, freedoms away from people that are doing things that are not consistent with, uh, with the expectations that are reflected in, in the United Nations challenges that we have. So it's very, we can take a principled stand and we take a principled stand, but in order to affect action and have change, then I think we have to work through the G7 and I, there are efforts being made to ensure that we do that, that we have the quantum necessary to be able to have a positive impact on those countries which are abusing people inappropriately. Thank you very much. Uh, candidate Jensen. Um, I believe that the UN is, dysfunctional this uh like as as canadians we stand for freedom respect human rights and there's countries that are blatantly antithetical to those and we need to address them by not doing business with them we need to i mean june 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 had it right with uh, sanctions but i think we might even need to do more 
um, what's going on with the communist uh, Chinese Communist Party, uh, the Taliban in Afghanistan. Like these are not, these aren't, you know, happy people that we can work with. They're they're a real threat to human rights all over the world, and I don't think we should be doing business with them. Thank you very much. If there are no rebuttals, we're going to do a little shift here. Uh, we feel that uh, having a technical difficulties for candidate Hogue, I would like to go back to a couple of questions for him before we finish off for the day. And I, I wanna make this as fair as possible given the circumstances. And I thought maybe we could give him one minute to respond, but then give each of the other two candidates their 30 second rebuttal time. So that uh, we just wanna hear from everybody here that we can, despite our technical difficulties. Let's go back to the Canadian uh, chamber question on border and COVID-19. The question asked was, as a border community, Canada-US relations is even more important. The Canada-19 pandemic has made those relations more complex. If elected, what actions will you and your party take, if any, to work towards open, more cross-border travel and for business and trade? Well, the actions we're taking now are grounded in, in scientific medical practice. And I think they're ones that are we're proceeding safely and appropriately to respond uh, to the challenges that we have. We obviously want to have that balance between functioning with the economy as the United States is our most important trading partner. And we've got to ensure that we balance that with uh, the effects that COVID have had. And uh, I think we're doing a reasonable job with that. Uh, we've seen fluctuations in different provinces and the challenges they've had and the expressions that have been there. But uh, I believe that the strategies we're taking now are significant and appropriate given the time. Thank you very much. Is there any uh, further comment from either the uh, other two candidates? Yeah. We will move on to the next one, which uh, was the question from the chamber on systemic racism and discrimination. There are increased calls for racial injustice and reconciliation due to the discovery of unmarked graves of indigenous children at former residential schools and the alarming violence against visible minorities across the country. What are your party's specific commitments to address these issues? Candidate Oak? Well, just with respect to systemic racism, uh, when we had, when we saw the, the Islamophobia in particularly in, in, uh, in London, Ontario, where four, four Muslims were run over and killed and they identified that as a terrorist act. We've got to actually make sure that we identify people who are terrorists. We have now identified one group of gangs, the bad boys, as terrorists, and therefore the changes happen with respect to what happens to them when they get charged in court. The whole notion of racism I've seen expand dramatically, and I think part of that is due to social media. We've always had people live on the perimeters. We're now finding ways to connect. And I was told by the leader of the Muslim Association of Canada that there are 250 white racist groups in Canada, 250. And I think that's shocking. And I think that we need to be able to take action to ensure that that type of behavior, when it turns into action, you can believe what you want to believe, you can think what you want to think, but you can't take action in Canada to go take that type of discrimination and express that type of racism as we've seen. We've seen that in different ways in our communities. We've seen it in, in Vancouver. And I think that we should be taking greater action. I think, for instance, that the live streaming that we see happening on social media that connect these people, that resulted in Congress being attacked in the United States with people from all over the United States. And we're connecting people who have these racist views or are connected through social media. And we should be allowing that the CRTC has the ability to challenge that, to, to break that down, live streaming, where Facebook got to, to ban Trump. It should be government that makes those decisions, not, not businesses. And I think that's one way that we can handle and start to deal with the Thank the you very much, uh, Candidate Holt. Uh, we'll have an uh, additional comment from Candidate Jensen. I'm, we're not hearing you. Sorry. <laughs> Though I agree with with some of what uh, candidate Hogue was saying, but uh, I believe that you're setting a bad precedent because then, like you, you can't just shut people up. Light is the best disinfectant. I, I mean, a lot of these groups need to be cut off at the heels. I agree, but the way to do it is not to censor everybody. And I, I believe that's what uh, your Bill C-10 was going to do, uh, Bill C-36. Like, these are, these are not good things, and they, hor they hurt freedom in our country. Thank you very much. Uh, any other comment, Candidate Lou? Thank you very much. Uh, I think 
we have time, we'll do one more repeat question. Um, how does your party rate the importance of addressing climate change against the country's economic priorities and what specific commitments do you have to address issues like BC's wildfires in the future? Candidate Hope. Well, our, uh, our party has taken a very strong position with respect to climate and climate change. We have uh, set goals and uh, we set to a net zero emissions by 2050. We've set to preserve 25% of our lands and oceans by 2025, protecting nature's including old growth forests and planting 2 billion trees to help Canada get to net zero. Our plan is actually a plan that is not just a vision, it's often the future with a goal, it has steps, All, every step of the way there's actions that can be measured. Mark Jacquard has rated our green action plan as an eight out of 10 on greenhouse gases, policies, and costs and promises. The Conservatives scored a five out of 10. Climate change leader, Dan Wolowitz of Clean Energy Canada has gone on record as saying that our plan has done a lot of hard things as government exemplified by the carbon tax. And our platform offers more specific detailed effective actions that we'd love that we would love the opportunity to take when we form government. Thank you very much. Is there any additional comment from the other two candidates? It is time to move into closing comments for the day and, and you'll each have one minute to speak. And we are going to start with candidate Jensen. Could that be opening statements that we have? Yeah, so uh, Thanks for letting me uh, get together with everybody and, and talk about these issues. Uh, this is my first time in the rodeo, so to speak, and uh, yeah, it's been really enlightening. And uh, um, I just want to say, at the end of the day, I, I believe that uh, we need to protect our freedoms. And I, I, I'm a small government guy, and I, I think taxing I, these ideological taxes and stuff, there's no real proof that the money goes where it needs to go. Um, and I think you're, you're hampering small business, you're hampering uh, Canadian individuals and families, you're, you're keeping them from their goals when you tax them into oblivion. Like, so I, I, think, we need to, I think we need to open up and, and uh, be free and, and get rid of these silly mandates and uh, this major government overreach because of COVID. Um, yeah, that's all I gotta say. Thank you very much. We'll move on to candidate Lou. Thank you so much for having me today. Um, and I'd like to say New Democrats are different. And um, I would like to think that I'm different than what we've seen in the past because we're, we're working people. I'm a working people, I'm a working person. Um, I have a day job. Uh, and for our whole history, we have fought for better working conditions and standards that lift everyone up. And that is including you know, small businesses, that, that's including families, that's including making sure that our community is supported and we're, we're here uh, being with each other and being present with each other. We know that good jobs uh, treat people fairly and make a real difference to Canadian families and that setting Canadians up for success um, in the work world benefits all of us and it benefits our, our future. So new ways of thinking can always, can always shape up our recovery um, from the COVID-19 crisis and make our economy fair and de deliver the results that we want. Um, we will want to make sure that uh, the people that you're electing are fighting for you, that they have your best interests in mind. And that is what I am pledging to you today. And I hope that, uh, you know, you, you will go, you'll step into that polling station on September 20th and you'll make a decision that benefits you and your family and all Canadians the best. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And closing arguments from candidate Hogue. Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to be a part of this. And uh, unfortunately, I was out of it for a little while and struggled to get back into it. The, uh, it's been evident in terms of the discussions that we've had today that there's a lot of need for us to have coordinated, integrated approaches to things. As I've described in the past, that when Canada was formed in 1867, healthcare was a doctor riding a horse and education was a was a schoolhouse. Now we now we have to ensure that the federal government has a way of integrating and coordinating with provinces. And we've seen that with daycare and a number of other things. I have uh, been very fortunate to have worked in government at all three levels and have seen ways that we can actually integrate and coordinate that type of strategy. And uh, I think that's ever so important in this time as we're looking at new types of challenges to have that. So my opportunities have, uh, in terms of those levels of government and the opportunity has given me a chance to look at what happens to end users? How do we actually consult the people who are impacted meaningfully by policy? And certainly the chamber talks about their businesses. We have to be, consult with them and ensure that we do that in a broad-based way to change our future. 
Thank you very much, Candidate Hogue. Thank you very much, all three candidates. For, for my part, uh, it's a, a real pleasure to hear from you, and I, I will be watching out I, my best to candidate uh, Finley. I, I, I hope she's doing well, and I would love it if uh, her team was able to record this for her, and we'd love to hear some of her answers on this as well. And, uh, and back to you, Rita. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Really appreciate all of the candidates, your answers, and uh, you know your thoughtful reflections on, on each of the various topics. Thank you, Lance, for doing a great job moderating, and uh, especially as we try to figure out uh, technical difficulties. Uh, and uh, can hope I'm glad you're able to come back on. And we certainly do send our best wishes to uh, candidate Carolyn Finley. Uh, so just want to give you some reminders about voting. Uh, you can actually get out and vote now at any Elections Canada office uh, until September 14th, 6 p.m. Uh, the closest one to uh, our riding is at uh, Highway 10 and 152nd Benchmark Business Centre. Um, here's a, a map with the Elections Canada um, offices in our area, and uh, you can also uh, check on uh, elections.ca. You can also vote by mail-in ballot. You have to submit your request online or by phone as well by September 14th, 6 p.m. Uh, then Elections Canada mails you a kit uh, and then you mail uh, back your ballot and deadlines do apply. So again, uh, we just wanna let people know all of their options to vote. A reminder that uh, advanced polls actually open tomorrow, will be open for four days. So uh, tomorrow, Friday, September 10th, Saturday, Sunday, and then Monday. Uh, and you have to vote at your designated polling, uh, designated polling station, which will be on your voter ID card, or you can, again, go on elections.ca to find that information. If you go to a poll, uh, where your name is not on the list, you will be turned away. Uh, I don't think they provide any exceptions for that. And of course, election day is Monday, September 20th, uh, and polls are open from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. So please, uh, you know, make your plans to get out and vote, tell your friends, your family. We live in a democracy. We really have to exercise that right. And a reminder just to, um, you know, be respectful to uh, anyone out there uh, who, and just again, remind our circles, even if you disagree with someone, um, it is, is to be uh, kind and respectful. And next slide. Again, the candidates for our riding, Carrie Lynn Finley for the Conservative Party of Canada, Gordy Hogue, Liberal Party of Canada, Gary Jensen, People's Party of Canada, and June uh, Liu, New Democratic Party of Canada. I'd like to thank our sponsors again, the Fraser Valley Real Estate Board, Chambers Plan, and the White Rock BIA. Again, thank you on behalf of the South Surrey and White Rock Chamber of Commerce, our members and board of directors. Um, and uh, please know that this recording is going on Facebook Live. It will be there if you want to share with others. Uh, it will be on our elections resource page, which we have created for the community that's on our website. Uh, it, it's sswr.ca slash 2021-federal.election. Um, and the video will be there, as well as links to all the candidates, their party platforms, and all the uh, Elections Canada links as well, and, and uh, information that I shared about um, advanced poll dates, et cetera. So thank you again, uh, and uh, get out and vote.